Eight mistakes wizards always makes. Okay, I'll take it back. That seems a bit harsh. Maybe known issues that D&D has that it just can't seem to design out would be more accurate. But it doesn't fit on the title card, so alarmist statement it is. I've skipped some stuff that continues through editions because it's iconic to the brand. Alignment, initiative, quadratic wizards, imperial measurements, challenge ratings, different uses of the word levels. Oh, and everyone's darling, the short sword. In no particular order, number one, stealth. Stealth is a tough one to pin down because it's, uh, stealthy? 4th and 5th edition both had to have rules clarifications on using the stealth skill and hiding. When and where can I try and use stealth? Has someone already spotted me? Would they be surprised by my presence? Am I trying to get an edge in combat? Am I scouting or infiltrating somewhere? How perceptive are my opponents? Am I aware of them? Do I still spring traps? What about the rest of my team? Am I leaving footprints? Am I making any sounds? What's the cover and lighting like? Are the guards on high alert? Do they have special senses? Has my PC just crawled through a sewer to get here? Ugh. There's so many variables for concealment. No wonder game designers struggle with it. In a game of the imagination, where you have to talk through what the characters are doing, it can spoil the surprise of a sudden stealth attack and lead to disagreements when it comes to positioning and cover if you aren't explicitly explaining or marking on the map what's going on like you do in a war game. In a miniature war game, you can draw a line of sight between units and can get a firm yes or no if they're in range or can be seen. You can kind of duplicate that in D&D with maps and minis, but not everyone wants to be exacting and tactical. The fundamental problem with stealth is that it's an active role made by the player. They know their bonus and the result, so they know if they did well or not. They can't always see the DM spot check, but in most games I've been in, the DM ends up saying whether they're hidden or not. And if you get a 22 on your roll, you're pretty confident that you've nailed it. This doesn't make a lot of sense, as the character can't see in the third person to see how well they're concealed. Okay, uh, unless they have a familiar, or the rest of the party messages them or something. Cat Molville... What? Oh. Uh, Matt Colville. Sorry, dude. Would make a good tabaxi bard, though. Somebody make that a thing. Uh, yeah. Anyway, back to stealth. Yeah, so Matt suggests having the DM role for the stealth check and the monster's perception. No matter what the result, the character will always think they're well hidden until they get caught. This is much more realistic and adds more tension to your game. The other problem with stealth is stealth's bigger brother, invisibility. You can use those clear minis to mark where you are on a map or be very explicit about movement when playing Theatre of the Mind. But if the DM can see where you are, it does make it difficult for them not to try and spot your character even if the monsters are actually unaware of their presence. This happens less often from the player's side, as the DM rarely puts out invisible creatures until they appear, because it spoils the surprise. Resist the urge to call for an active perception check in a seemingly empty room. Even if the characters fail, the players will suspect something is up and start flailing around looking for your displacer beast. Okay, so this has kind of been solved by the passive perception score, but some characters end up with such high numbers that it can be tempting to risk a check because they might actually fail it. In one of our games, we had a player take their invisible character off the board so the DM couldn't see them. He marked his position off on some grid paper so he could always show the rest of the team he wasn't cheating his movement. It kind of worked, but felt like a lot of faffing about. Now the award for the most retcon class goes to... Number 2. The Ranger. Third edition was revised to 3.5, in part because the Ranger class sucked eggs. In fourth edition, the player's handbook Ranger had the only at-will power that could hit two targets, making it the most powerful class at level one. It also had lots of shifting and movement abilities that made it hard to pin down and did a crap ton of damage. In fifth edition, while the Hunter archetype was decent enough, mostly because it copied a lot from fourth, the base class features favoured Frenemy, and the Beastmaster just weren't very good. Case in point, what's the issue to revised Ranger class, which can be downloaded free from their website? To date, no other class has been retconned that badly, or that often. We had a standard and revised Ranger in one of our games, and the revised Ranger was just better? Morgan Webb, who plays a Ranger in the Ak Inc. games, uses the revised Ranger template. I know this because she added damage on for her favoured enemy in one of the live games recently, so see for yourself. Even in the sponsor games, and the official games, the base PHB class has been abandoned. Stepping away from the mechanics for a second, the Ranger also has a bit of an identity crisis. 
it's trying to do too many things, and I think that's why they have so much trouble balancing it out. Aragorn is held up as the stereotypical ranger, but let's be honest, he's just a fighter. He only gets a bow in the films because Peter Jackson gave him one. He's just a fighter with elvish, survival, nature, history, and a herbalism kit proficiency. The remains of his people are called rangers, but that doesn't make it a class. In 5th edition, rangers get spells. Uh, why? Usually need high decks. Why? I don't remember Aragorn doing backflips or picking pockets. Favoured enemy and natural explorer are okay thematically, but are just a bump to tracking and survival type checks that expertise could have solved with one ability. Or a feat that anyone could choose. Survivalist feat, anyone? Tracker feat? The 4th edition ranger, on the other hand, is much more like Legolas skipping around all over the place and turning monsters into pincushions. That's the second purpose for the ranger, the sort of woodland archer type character. I don't know if this is a Robin Hood thing or an elf stereotype, but I find it strange that the scout archetype falls under rogue. An arcane archer is firmly glued to fighter. Shouldn't they be rangers? Making a ranged focus character is fine, but, oh, I get it. Ranger. The third type of ranger to blend into the mix is Drizzt, trademark. Thanks to Bob, Drizzt, trademark, is also a ranger. So not only does there have to be bow support, there has to be a two weapon option for the ranger. Or split these right down the middle, with their two weapon fighting and ranged build options, where the powers were expressively for one or the other. The Beastmaster is a bit of a hybrid. Wilderness woodsman that's befriended nature, so has a little tame buddy that follows them around. For some reason that doesn't make them a druid? So to recap, Aragorn plus Drizzt, trademark, plus Robin Hood, plus Mowgli and Baloo, makes for one spicy ranger suit. How do we fix it? I don't think we can. You either split off those guys to other classes, or accept that those are the type of characters people like to play, and leave them all bundled together. It's just going to take a lot of careful design work to get each element to play nice, come a new edition. Number 3. High Level Play 5th edition is clearly front-loaded towards lower levels, to get players excited for playing new characters and to make multiclassing less of a penalty. The Druid, Paladin, Fighter, Cleric, Barbarian, Rogue and Monk all get very strong abilities before they get to 5th level, and tail off towards the end. Ok, so Monk's pretty even throughout, but 3 attacks at level 2 is nothing to be sniffed at. 5th has each class set on an archetype by level 3. What's that, like 900 XP? grind on a couple of bears or two dozen zombies and you're done. At least 4th edition made you get to level 10 first and then had more choices to choose at higher levels giving you further incentive to keep levelling. You'll notice that most of the live games have characters between levels 5 and 9. Apparently that's the sweet spot for 5e? But then what's the rest of the class abilities, spells and higher challenge rating monsters for? Since the end of 2nd edition really there's been a scarce supply of official campaign and encounters for when you reach those lofty heights. Spells can also cause a bit of a problem here. It's not that wizards have run out of ideas, but choosing a 4th level spell that does basically the same thing as a 2nd level, but with more damage dice, doesn't really seem worth it. At least in 5th, they allow you to spend a higher slot for a boost, but 3rd and 4th editions just couldn't stay away from incremental spells for nostalgia reasons. Cure Light Wounds, Cure Serious, Cure Deadly, Heal, Mass Heal, come on. XP based levelling methods can be slow if you follow the traditional route. I've noticed that groups have been shifting over towards milestones or other simplified methods to get through levels and give their players a sense of achievement. We've all got a limited amount of time and getting to those high levels gives you new enemies to fight and more to work with for spells and tactics. No one wants to fight skeletons and wolves over and over again with different characters. It gets boring really fast. So high level play needs more support with books and adventures that people actually want to go through perhaps an accelerated levelling system that encourages pushing forward and more spread out abilities and meaningful spell choices that make gaining high levels fun and worth the bother. Number 4. Chases and Running Fast moving action is hard to play out in a tabletop game. You have to give each of your players a chance to take their turn, so it's fair, but that slows the encounter right down. A chase scene requires time pressure, and while you can push your players out of game with timers and maybe choosing one action each, it's just not the same as making gut instinct decisions and reacting to events on the fly. Fourth ignores it entirely, and there's not a lot of guidance in the DMG in fifth. A list of complications and obstacles is fine, but it needs more mechanical and storytelling support. Page 252 of the DMG has a bit about dashing and exhaustion levels, which has potential, but it needs fleshing out. 
how do I make this tense and interesting for players sitting around a table? Is it a cutscene kind of thing that they should just passively listen to? Do we roleplay it out, or do we add randomness to the mix with dice rolling? The base walking speed is the number of feet you can travel in a 6 second combat round if you only use your move action. But how does that work when one side is trying to get away from another rather than fight? If my character can go 60 feet in 6 seconds, that's less than 7 miles an hour. That's nothing to a human sprinter, let alone a heroic character with above average stats. You kind of need to lay everything out to the players so they can see the terrain and which routes they could take, but you don't want to give away too many twists and turns, so either draw it as you go or fog of war it. Theatre of the mind is a bit too floaty to run a chase. You'll end up in an argument unless you want to make it a skill challenge. Roll initiative, roll streetwise or survival for tracking, athletics, acrobatics to get ahead, grapple check, done, blah. Initiative should ideally be rolled off intelligence to see how quickly characters can make a decision before they act. The speed factor initiative on page 271 of the DMG might be somewhere to start. High speed characters should get some sort of bonus to reward their choice. But what about spells? We've got ones that increase speed, turn you into an animal, fly, make the terrain more difficult, you can hit at long range, or just teleport around. Huh. Probably need to make a proper video on this one. Number 5. Resource Management and Actions Keeping track of consumable items, carry weight and spell slots can seem like busy work to some groups, but integral to the game for others, so it gets kept in edition after edition. Unless tracking items is needed for story reasons, like in a tough survival game, or your players keep taking advantage of you not staring over their shoulder all the time by carrying a ridiculous amount of things, there's really no onus on the DM to worry about supplies, lengths of rope, or the number of arrows you have. Plenty of newer indie games have looked resource management square in the face and said screw it. You either get unlimited access to mundane items because they're not considered important for the story, like in Open Legend, or it's assumed your character carries around everything they would regularly be expected to need, and if it's unusual, then it gets marked off, like in Blades in the Dark, or you have a usage die, like in the Black Hat. In the Black Hat, every time you use a torch or a bit of ammo, you roll a die. If you get a 1, the size of the die drops. Once you roll a 1 on a d4, that's it. You've run out and need to go buy more stuff. Simple. Number 6. The Economy the D&D economy is broken, and no amount of quantitative easing is going to bail the bankers out this time. It's never really mattered in-game, because accounting is boring, and nobody cares. But take a look at the trade goods on page 157 of the PHB, and you'll find that sheep are worth twice as much as a goat, and pigs are worth three goats. Goats give you fleece, milk, and meat, and can take out a troll, while pigs are only good for ham, gammon, pork, pork scratchings, and eating your rubbish. Wait, wait, I forgot bacon, I forgot bacon, all is forgiven. If you want to take our real world economy into account, in medieval Europe, even small quantities of cinnamon, saffron and silk were incredibly expensive, as they had to come all the way from Asia Minor, Asia Major and Africa. An ox, meanwhile, was a common domesticated animal. So why is it worth more than silk and the same as saffron in 5e? A pound of copper costs more than a pound of iron, but copper is a lot less useful for a player character in D&D as it makes rubbish weapons. Why not tax them on things they might actually want, Watsy? That being said, three mastiffs are not worth one riding horse. And how is a chariot two and a half times the cost of a carriage? You don't even get a seat or a roof. A saddle is apparently worth 50 chickens. And a comfortable lifestyle can be yours for just a sheep a day. Uh, okay, I'm parking this one before I get a headache. Next! Number 7. Armour and Weapons Armour in D&D doesn't deflect or reduce damage like you might expect, because... logic. Instead, armour gives a static armour class bonus that an enemy must hit before they can do you damage. It's an abstract hold-on from older editions, rather than a realistic method of protection. Standard armour doesn't even give you any benefits, like resistance to slashing weapons. You have to be proficient in it, which only really makes sense for full play. Why can't my wizard wear hide and get the AC? It's also been simplified right down to armour and shields. Helmets, gauntlets and layers of gambeson don't even get a look in. Studs don't make a difference to the effectiveness of leather armour, just as rhinestones on your biker jacket don't make you cool. Weapons is another odd one. Choosing your weapon has been nerfed since 2nd edition. High crit weapons, speed bonuses, bonus to attack and specialisation have all gone. There was an extensive list in 3rd, it was reduced in 4th and further simplified in 5th to more of a flavour thing. They are still divided into simple and martial, which I guess is supposed to indicate their difficulty to learn and wield, but then a fighter can use the whole table at level 1. 
Martial weapons are generally the best, but it's not like soldiers never bothered with spears and daggers. Weapons still do different amounts of damage to suggest the lethality of the wounds, but it's not all that realistic. If I hit you over the head with a club, you're still just as dead as if I hit you over the head with a two-handed maul. If you've ever had to explain why it isn't to a new player in D&D, don't worry, you're not the only one. Hit points are meant to be another abstraction. They're not how much life you have, but sort of how long it takes to wear you down until you're dealt a deadly blow. But then, why isn't it called stamina, or luck, or adrenaline? Weapons, armour and HP are all needed mathematically to make the combat work, but are one of the most unrealistic parts of the game. Then again, if you look at simulation too hard in the face, you either get bored, don't dare risk getting into a fight with anything bigger than a chicken, or spend all day choosing plots in the cemetery because you've killed a dozen would-be heroes by session 3. Number 8. Balance and Power Creep This comes about when you get a bad case of Supplements and Additions Syndrome. Wizards is a business and it has to make money to survive. The easiest way for it to make money is to make new content for us to buy. But once the core books have been released for an edition, with all the new rules and features, you've kind of got everything you need to play. So why do we need more books? Well, they have new stories to play through with your group, but if you can homebrew, you don't need an adventure module. Alright then, how about some new compelling character options for you to try? Well okay, but only if they're cooler than what I have already. See the problem? New stuff has to play well with what's out so far, otherwise those older options can seem worthless or just rubbish, and won't get played. It's not normally as bad with RPGs as there's no real win condition. The mechanics aren't usually the be-all and end-all, but this is a major concern with collectible card games and war games. Whenever something new comes out, it has to be checked for balance, so it doesn't make an older choice obsolete, because if it does, you can bet your player base will find out very quickly. Magic is a great example of a game constantly having to wrestle with balance problems, while Warhammer has suffered power creep again and again. If it's a competitive game, it can run away with you, as players try to get the edge on their opponents. You might hear the phrases dominant strategy, local meta, and current meta. That's all about players thinking that they've solved the game. 4th edition was very balanced to the point where the classes were almost the same in the way that they behaved. This is too far in the opposite direction, perhaps. Unlike 3rd, which is rife with exploits, 5th edition doesn't have many game-breaking combinations, which is a strength of its lower numbers and careful design. 5e has done pretty well not to put out too many options too fast. They've all been tested thoroughly through the Unearthed Arcana playtests, so maybe we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel for power creep. Bonus mistake, the D12. The D12 is notorious for not getting enough love, just ask M&M. It's the least used die for spells, abilities and even random tables in D&D, and most RPGs in general. It seems to have been included as part of the polyhedral set to fill the void between the D10, the 10% chance, and the D20, the 5% chance. I don't know if it's because people think more easily in 10s, go team metric, or because there is so much swing between a 1 and a 12 that 2D6 is just more satisfying. It's not like it rolls like crap. I'm looking at you, D4. Don't think you can hide behind the others. You've busted my foot for the last time. Next time you roll up a character, remember the poor dusty D12 in your bag and play a barbarian. Or roll it in place of that treacherous D4 and divide the result by three. This list was kind of subjective, but I reckon I put in enough adjectives to cancel things out. Designing a role-playing game is hard. Even with the huge numbers of playtesters the last two editions of Dungeons & Dragons have had, they can't catch everything before release. It's not a question of lazy quality control or broken design, it's just that a tabletop role-playing game relies so much on the random individuals that play it that you just can't build something that works for everyone 100% of the time. You can't be so prescriptive and rigid with the rules that you design out any kind of free choice and expression from the players and Dungeon Master. That's why you leave blanks on the map and let your creativity push the story forward. If every scenario has been considered, every rules complication has been FAQ'd, and all the players are balanced evenly, you're playing a board game. There's no win condition in D&D, except having fun, so sometimes the mechanics have to be treated as guidelines, rather than definitive truth. Whoa, I'm a bit zen there at the end, didn't I? Right, that's your lot. Eight hardy perennials D&D just can't seem to get rid of. Should the game be watertight at release? How have these issues been fixed in other RPGs? Let me know downstairs. Thanks for watching. Take a rummage in my description box for more content on this topic and subscribe to get more plus one wisdom. See you next time.